When, candidate, when candidates get into the lab for biology practicals, the first thing they will notice is that they will observe a lot of organisms that are placed before them. They will see a variety of organisms which are placed on any side. As here we have had some organisms, we have here A, we have B, C, D, E, F, and G. So this is uh, organism G. So this usually is question one for the biology practicals. And when they observe these organisms, what is required of them is that they are supposed to first of all leave their seats with their question papers, come up to the table, which is called a walking post, observe these organisms, and first of all, identify the names of these organisms. They may not bother themselves so much about the scientific names, but they first of all give these organisms common names. So if a candidate ob ob observes and realizes that this one is organism A, that this is starfish, B, the second organism here is the centipede, then the third one, organism C, is the earthworm, this is a sea urchin, this is a snake, just call it a snake, then this is a groundnut plant, and then this is a bird, or we call it a chick, or a fowl, or whatever. Then that candidate now knows this, and then goes to his or her seat. And then when in the seat, he then reads, because the question always states precisely that the candidate draws a table, and that for the first column of the table, he writes specimens, I'll do it on the board, four columns, column one is small, two, three, and then the last column. So this one is the specimen, specimen, this one is the phylum, the class, and then at times you have the name here, you are asked to give the name. So if you are asked to give the name, when you observe the organisms, you come and note the names of the organisms. You write here A, B, C, D, E, whatever, the number of organisms you have. And then you come here, you give the names of the organisms. But at times, the candidates are asked not to give the names, but to give, let's say, the habitat. To give the habitat of the organism. So in such a situation, you give the names on your question paper, and then instead, on this column, you will be stating the habitats of this organism. At times, the candidates are also asked, instead of giving the habitats, to give, let's say, the class feature, a class feature of the organism. So it means that in such a situation, when they observe organism A, they will give one characteristic that belongs, that is belongs to all the members of that class to which organism A belongs. If they were asked to give one feature of the phylum, they will give one feature that, that pertains to all the members of that phylum to which that organism A belongs. So we now realize that at times they could also be asked instead of the class feature, to give a diagnostic to give a diagnostic feature to give a diagnostic peculiar that outrightly distinguish that organism from other members of that uh, phylum or class to which that organism belongs. So if we take, for example, this our organism A, which we have identified as starfish, so a diagnostic feature, the feature that clearly brings out the difference between this starfish and any other organism is that it has this spine and we also see that it has a ventral pore and the ventral pore is not its feature because we have the sea urchin that also have the ventral pore. So the diagnostic feature of this starfish is the tube feet. So we can see the rules of tube feet here which it uses for movement. So if you are asked to state a diagnostic feature and this is one of your organisms, you will state here that organism A, the diagnostic feature is presence of tube feet. So customarily, identifying organisms and stating characteristics are not just all, they are just part of it, but they very much depend on the larger groupings of this organism in such a way that we now have organism A there, which is a uh, the starfish, and we are supposed to give the phylum. Just wait. We are supposed to give the phylum to which organism A belongs. So organism A is a starfish. We know that it belongs to the phylum Echino, Echino dermata, Echino dermata. So it belongs to the class Stele. and then if we are giving the diagnostic feature, what we write here is presence of tube feet 
for morphine. So we'll give this as a diagnostic feature. It means that it is the only organism that has two feet for movement. But when you write now like this, this will be marked separately, this one separately, and this one separately. What happens? How is the marking done? It is done in the way that if you are writing this phylum echinodermata and you do not follow the norms of biological taxonomy, instead of you starting it with a capital E, you start it with a small e. What happens is the examiner circles it, marks it wrong, and eventually, since the class is a subgroup to the phylum, this one is marked wrong. And the feature, since it is also a subgroup of the phylum, it is marked wrong. So, candidates should be very, very aware of the fact that the rules of biology, of biology taxonomy are observed. So, if it is a situation where this one is written correctly, where this one is written correctly, and then the spelling somewhere has a problem. Let's say this R is not there. If this R is not there, then the examiner circles this part, so showing that there's an error there, and then map it wrong, and automatically the, the class and the feature which comes behind are all wrong. So the candidate loses mark just because of the spelling which is here. So in such a line, candidates are reminded that spellings in biology taxonomy are a very important part which makes them to, award, uh, to be awarded marks. So if the, 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 the phylum was written correctly and then the class was wrongly written, let's say it was even started with a small s, then this one will be marked right, this one circled, marked wrong, and this one automatically is wrong because it is a subset of this. But if this one were correct and this one is wrong, this one will be marked correct and this one will be marked wrong. So candidates here have to have in mind that as they go in for practical question one, this with observation and classification, and they will notice that the rules must be followed. If they were to write scientific names of the, of the organism, they must write the names to follow the biological standard. That is, the genus name must start with a capital letter, the species name with a small letter, and the two must be underlined separately, and the spelling must be correct. There is no taking away or adding something to the spelling. If you don't underline it separately, it is marked wrong. And if you underline it continuously, it is marked wrong. So that should stay at the base, at the back of the brain of any candidate who's going in to carry out biology practicals before you succeed. So after classifying the organisms and giving the various features that might have been asked, usually other questions are usually asked on the organisms that are placed before the candidate linked to the ecological relationships of the organisms. So we have the five organisms here. We have the starfish, we have the centipede, earthworm, sea urchin, we have the snake, we have the groundnut plant, and then we have the bird, which is here. So you see that we have animals and we have a plant. We also have the bird there, which is an animal that lives in the, in the trees. That's an arboreal animal. So you now realize that if you were asked, let's take for example, we have C, which is uh, the earthworm, we have B, which is the centipede, then we have F, which is the plant, and then we have uh, G, which is the bird. If you were asked to give the ecolo ecological relationship between centipede, uh, earthworm, uh, snake, groundnut plant, and the bird, what you have to do is, first of all, think of where these organisms find themselves, where they live. See how they coexist, how each organism benefits from the other, and how each organism harms the other. Firstly, you realize that centipedes live in the, under the decaying leaves, and the reason for them living under the decaying leaves is to avoid desiccation. But they live under the decaying leaves, and they are also carnivorous. They can feed on animals, on other animals. So centipedes can kill a bird. Centipedes can feed on birds. It's possible. Centipedes have mandibles, and they have poisons. So when they bite the, the, the little bird, they will inject poison and the poison will paralyze the bird and after they will start cutting it with the manipulated jaws and they will eat it up. So that is a relationship. But you realize that the bird which is there feeds on the grains of the ground to obtain its food and the earthworm which is here, it softens the soil. Both the centipede and the earthworm, they are living in decaying soil. They, soft, they eat up the, the decaying leaves and as such they add humus onto the soil. And this soil now has minerals that are available for organism F, which is a groundnut plant which obtains through its roots and then it can grow. And when it grows up now and produces the seeds, 
The birds now eat the seeds and the snake can swallow the bird. So you now realize that this is already a food chain, a very long food chain, and you can make food webs out of it. So this is an ecological relationship. At times you can even be asked to explain the use of uh, the, 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 the use of the earthworm to the farmer. So when you are not talking about the farmer, a man does not eat earthworms, but what it does is that the earthworm will help him to soften the soil, his plants will grow well, and then he can harvest the plants and either feed his animals with the plants, or he eats the plant or sells the plants for himself. So that is the use. So now you realize that this is a dicotyledonous plant, this is a groundnut plant, it has root nodules, these ones are not quite visible, it has root nodules, and the root nodules help to convert atmospheric nitrogen, that's the nitrogen that's found in the air, into the soil nitrates. And when the nitrates are in the soil, other plants which are growing in that environment help to absorb that nitrogen and they use it to manufacture their proteins. So you now realize that the link between these organisms is nothing strange. There's nothing that has come from space here. Everything is what you observe. And if you can be able to identify the habitats, as might have been the case here, then you see that it will be very, very easy for you to give a ecological relationship between these organisms. And when you give it, you always have so many marks on that uh, relationship.